That's, I'm sorry for the, okay. What I wanna do is make a few comments about COVID-19. You're lucky not un and unlucky. You had a major epidemic in Milano and other areas and the United States with its incompetent government uh, and horrible system uh, is now going for a major epidemic. But I think I wanna make a few comments on that because it's, it's unimportant for COVID-19. It is important, but for other illnesses as well. I'll talk a bit about nose breathing. I'll talk a bit about technology stress because so many of us, even as the countries are opening up, are still communicating by Zoom or other you know, media. And we're sitting much more in front of screens and many people develop eye fatigue, neck and shoulder pain, et cetera. So I'll focus on that. And we just have, a, that's an advertisement coming up. Uh, we have a new book coming out, which I highly recommend for everybody. It should be translated in Italian. So that's at the bottom. I'll do an ad later in addition. Okay, why are my reasons for my comments? We will be living with COVID-19 as countries open up. And every few years, there will be an emerging viral epidemic. COVID-19, COVID-XX is waiting in the wings and will be coming soon. That's the reality. So if you think of this and biofeedback or health, the risk of health is somehow how many viruses we get and how can we enhance our immune competence. And let me make a few more comments on that. If we look at the risk, which all of you know, both from Italian data, international data, the biggest per group who gets infected are those who have underlying health conditions, depending a bit on age. It's when we develop immune senescence. So what, less than 1% are younger than 20 and 20% 20 are 70 and older. In the United States and across the world, it's people from lower socioeconomic classes in the United States would be blacks, Latinos and others who are much more at risk. And men in Italy are also more at risk. In fact, there's no data that men are more at risk than women, even though more men are dying or getting sick. If you look at men and women in equal socioeconomic levels and jobs, the, the death rates and sickness rates are the same. What happens is that the health status of men is significantly worse than the women. They have more multiple illnesses called comorbidities. And the men tend to work in, in lower uh, jobs where they are more riskful as a group. Okay. If I look at it very quickly, and this is useful for biofeedback for anything, this tells you in Europe, at least the population, this tells you this slide here. And if you want, I will give Lucas all the slides and he can send them to you, if that's helpful. Uh, this is the, the actual data of the, all the people of comorbidities. That means multiple sicknesses. And look at it, as we are young, we have very few sickness, co other sicknesses. As we get older, this dark red line, this segment here, there have many people have it. No wonder this is where the high more the severity of illness occurs. And in the United States, this is obvious. Six in 10 people have chronic illnesses and four in 10 have two or more chronic illnesses. And part of the reason for my belief is that in the American South where the epidemic is now occurring, even with younger people, is because they have this. They have diabetes. They are very big, they're obese. Their immune system is suppressed and for many factors. And I thought if I would make a list of factors which I understand where, which we have control over to, that increase our risk. These are well-documented factors. 
to suppress our immune system. So when I work with clients or students, I not only think if they have a headache or hypertension or something else, how can biofeedback help? I want to ask the question, how can you boost your immune system? How can you optimize health where you have control and we are always live in a system? Well, one, obviously all these references are listed and I can give citations. Chronic stress. Well, you wouldn't be in this seminar if it wasn't chronic stress. You want to know about that. Obviously, pulmonary irritants, pollution, smoking, and for all the young people, the e-cigarettes. A big factor for air transmission and aerosol is recycled air. Almost all the big buildings we have, hospitals, businesses, in winter and in summer, the air is either heated or cooled and re cycled without being filtered. So we have created a perfect environment for airborne transmission. Keep that, I'll come back to that. It significantly increases infection rates. Okay, feeling hopeless and helpless reduce, reduces immune competence, loneliness. And in the United States, not as much as in Europe, many older people are extremely lonely and isolated. And then one of the biggest factors that contribute to many of our GI problems, to diabetes, to inflammatory disease is our Western industrialized, U, I call it US diet, which I also see spreading through Italy. There is McDonald's, there is Coca-Cola, <laughs> There are many others which are extremely harmful for the system. We have underestimated how harmful the US diet is of process of extremely highly processed foods with pesticides, etc. It increases inflammation, reduces immune competence. And then the result, because now we're all sitting, like all of you are sitting right now. We have developed sitting disease. We do not move very much in our modern world. We end up developing obesity. We eat too much because it's always around. It's an evolutionary trap. We are wired to take in calories for survival, except now all the calories are there or all the sweets, etc. And then our excessive sugar, alcohol, and simple carbohydrates. Let me keep going for a moment. Well, you've been sitting for a moment. What I like you all to do is just stand up. Just stand up. And I will do it too. Oh, and, and Giovanni, please stand up. Bruno, please stand up. I can't see all of you. I know some of you have turned off your... And now with your arms, reach up really reach up and now almost skip in place like a little kid just skip even giovanni put your arm up when you wait and smile. you can even smile even more great enough and now you can see and check how do you feel you feel a little bit more awake Yes, maybe even happier. Notice, and yet when I work at the computer, without any awareness, I'm gonna be talking, I, I texting, even when I work with clients, by telebiofeedback, I'm just sitting there and do very little movement. It's one of the bigger risks, as you just exp And note how little physical change makes you feel better. Or the references I'm gonna skip. Now going back to the virus for a moment, the data looks like, which all of you are much more aware of than I am in Italy, that it's how much of the virus you get. It looks like it's both, not only whether the virus is virulent, it's 
how much. If you get a very little whiff, a tiny bit, you may not get very sick. It depends also on your immune system. If you get a lot of it, then you're highly at risk. So the medical staff in Milan and areas, they were being exposed to very big whiffs the whole time. Then even if you're quite healthy, your body almost cannot cope with it. There's lots of evidence for that. If you get a little bit, you do better. If you go back in our history of early childhood illnesses before vaccinations, it's interesting, children who got exposed in the playground, like playing outside, who got exposed to the sick person, they would go home, they would get sick, but they would have a mild case of the disease. Their brothers and sisters would get very sick. The reason is when I was outside playing, I got a little bit and somehow it helped my, there are always people for whom that can be fatal, even a little bit, but for most it wasn't. But their brothers and sisters who lived in the same house and in the same bedroom, this, the sick child would now breathe in and out the virus and the brothers and sisters would inhale it continuously, dose after dose after dose, and they would almost all get extremely sick. Second, if you do the viral concentration in the nose, those who have a mild and low virus count get the mild illness, those who have a high count are much more serious sick. And finally, the medical staff, as I said, in hospitals, medical and technical staff, those who work in closed spaces had higher incidence of infection than those who did not work in that. Okay, and you can see how it all works. This is people smoking e-cigarettes. You can imagine this all is the viral particles. You all know that. Or here is your cough. Again, you know that. And you can see the reason why now people, finally, after all this time, the, the WHO and Europe has said everybody should probably wear masks. Not that they protect you very much from inhaling the bacteria a little bit, but it distinctly protects the others. Okay, enough. What can you do on that side? One, I make that a rule for myself now, also when I work with clients in my office. I open all the windows to allow lots of air to go through. I use an, exa use an exhaust fan to be sure outside air goes through. Use a high particulate filter to filter out almost all the particulates. Which so when I work with clients, the windows are open and where I'm working, I have a, an high, an, uh, a HEPA filter. I try to not go into buildings with recycled air that includes stores or anything else where the air cannot flow through. And obviously, because of in California, the, and I recommend that, we should wear a mask if we are near other people. Because who knows? 40% of us could be infectious, never have symptoms. Okay, so the question is how to optimize your immune system. So let me go to the, what you can do. I describe factors that made it worse. Let me now, when I think of clients, what are things you can do to make it better? Ah, stress reduction, meditation, all different categories. For here, whether you use mindfulness training, whether you do biofeedback EMG training, what, all these combinations, autogenic training, progressive relaxation, you know, cognitive control, all ways to identify what the stressor is and how it can develop competence. Adequate sleep is critical. Simple to say, challenging to do, the whole world of sleep hygiene, etc., or having conflict before. How many of you watch news, watch television, or in United States would be um, Netflix at night? How many watch television at night before going to sleep or the screen? 
Okay, I know. And, and, and when you're younger, you may not be, and if you're younger, you're not gonna watch television, you're gonna be watching TikTok, you're searching uh, Instagram, you're searching Facebook, well, Facebook is for old fogies like me, Instagram is for the, the 20 year olds, and TikTok is for the, the teens. And then we do a whole series of Netflix in the United States of streaming. It's a disaster for your health if you do it before going to sleep. One, for the emotional arousal, I get activated by the visual stimuli, the sounds, and the blue light from the screen that suppresses the melatonin and inhibits sleep. So when I look at students, they're almost all sleep deprived. And so are many adults in the United States. Maybe the nicest part of COVID-19 is so many are at home, they may be sleeping better, although some have more family conflict and family abuse. Okay, optimism and hope, critical. But it's sometimes difficult when you think economically, what will happen next? But that is the, that's the whole cognitive component, social support. We underestimate how important this is. All the data shows, if you want to live to 103 or 105 or 100, have lots of friends and family members who you, with whom you interact many times. Ask yourself the simple question in social support. Who can you call at two o'clock at night who will, who will do anything for you at that point. So if you don't feel well, you can call them or knock on the door next door and they will just drop what they're doing and they will help you out. How many have people like this? And are you like that for somebody else? Usually it's a spouse, but who else? Neighbors, etc. Work on that, that helps social support. Physical activity, critical. That includes for cancer research as well. People who do more physical activity. Just a little exercise you did earlier, you felt your energy going up. It's a metaphor for your immune system. Physical activity doesn't mean chronic, such exhaustion for such a long time without regeneration. It's always activity and regeneration. Connection to nature, or the Japanese would call this, you know, forest bathing. The data is overwhelming. If you, are, if you spend about a, an hour in nature looking at green with your eyes, your eyes can relax. You're inhaling all these chemicals from the trees and plants, which act as antibacterial, antiviral, and they tend to improve your mood. The data is quite overwhelming. Do it with another friend, take a nice walk. So after you have your cappuccino, go outside and walk in the park or maybe a glass of wine and then go to the park or in the trees. Increase air circulation, I've, I'm sorry. I've said that before, the diet you're lucky, do not eat the US diet, truly. It's very bad, US diet. Go back to your grandparents' diet with lots of olive oil and lots and lots of vegetables. Eat lots of vegetables and fruits. They all help the immune system. And every so often, which is many religious traditions have this, fast. If you fast for 16 hours, it seems to activate the immune system. That's remarkably challenging when I have these little snacks, which I like to eat. Let me do one more, two more things. There are some specific food substances that seem to be help the immune system. This list can be much longer, but they all have very good data. One is the, the servitants. That's just the, 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 uh, the antioxidant. That's what you find in fruits and vegetables, the curvitins. Turmeric seems to be anti-inflammatory. You know, have a half a tablespoon in a hot cup of water. Uh, this is the one we all like ourselves. It's the resveratrol that's in the red wine. 
which seemingly has some evidence. Vitamin D is critical for the immune system. We have now have gotten scared of the sun because of a melanoma or skin cancer. You need vitamin D, you need sunlight. Vitamin E is, is critical and it, it helps the immune system. Many people are low in the United States, 88% are low on vitamin E and D. It's massive. Zinc, these help viral infections, and I would recommend vitamin C because we tend to be too low. There are many others, but these I can give fairly good evidence for. Enough. What are the dietary sources? I don't believe really as much as possible eating it as a pill. Get it from the food you eat. You know, the servitants are the flavonoids in fruits, veggies, apples. The resveratrol found in the red wine, the rhubarb, blueberries, vitamin D, fatty fish. Vitamin E, sunflower seeds, almonds. Get it from that much better than eating the pills. Anyway, enough on that. But the data is remarkable that if you look in the United States with low economic classes where people eat the US diet, very poor diet, that if you enroll people in a unique food program where they eat these healthy vegetables, they, they don't have to pay for it, they get this versus essentially almost like I'll call the McDonald's foods. You see a four, within a year, you see a 40% decrease in the risk of death and serious complications and an 80 percent drop in medical costs this data is remarkable but it makes sense to me okay well you have been let's just go to the next one for a sec yes i want to do this for a sec i want to shift to talking about at least one or two strategies that you can do yourself and which are important it's an area of research i've worked about and that would be breathing. So once again, stand up. And Giovanni, stand up too. You can stand up too, great. And Ralph Nichols, you can stand up. I know you're hiding there, but do stand up. I cannot see the other ones on my screen right now, but just stand up. Now I'd like you to put your hand on your stomach and one on your chest. And take a big breath. Take a very big breath. And then let the air go out. One more time. Take a very big breath. Take a very big breath. And let it go. Great. I'll let you sit. And what did you observe? I'll let you sit. Who observed that when you took a big breath, your chest went up? You found this area getting bigger. Yes, you can put your hands up. Who observed when you took a big breath, you got taller, you got bigger? Put your hand up. Great. And those who cannot do their hands, you can always use, you can indicate it on the screen, remember, by using the uh, comment, let me look at that. Uh, well, we want the buttons at the bottom. Okay, great, with the fun. Who observed that when you exhaled, when the air went out, you got slightly smaller and you, sh and you shrank, you got smaller. Right? Who noticed when you inhaled or exhaled, who noticed when you inhaled, you only breathe through your nose or also did you breathe through your mouth? Who breathes also through their mouth? Either inhale or exhale. Any of you? Okay. Well, when you, if you said yes to any of those questions, you're, you have dysfunctional breathing and it puts you at risk. If you found your chest expanding, if you found you, you just got taller, 
if you found when you exhaled, you collapsed. If you breathe through your mouth, no. You, are, you have increased your risk for getting more stress. You have increased your risk for reducing the nitric oxide. So you really want to breathe more like this, as this side here, and not like that. A quick summary, this test works with most clients in one second, where you can see their dysfunctional pattern. Why did you do this? Well, we gave a defense reaction, we were sensitive, we were scared. We gave an alarm reaction, we were fearful. For, for many of the women, also the men, we have designer gene syndrome, our stomach was held in tight. We couldn't really expand our stomach. That, and we don't want a big stomach because who would love me if my stomach was big? Or I had a history of abdominal surgery by which I learned to breathe only in my chest. Or I want to be powerful. Dominance. You know, but we forget breathing is much more than just gas exchange. It is gas exchange, yes, that's a critical one. It affects our sympathetic activity. But equally important, and that's for the people who have GI distress, people with uh, irritable bowel, people with acid reflux, with many others, people with back injuries. B correct breathing is the pump that allows lymph and venous return to circulate around the abdomen. So it's, this, by letting this get bigger, and then come back in. I am pumping the lymph and venous vessels, allowing improved circulation. So we have much less stasis. Almost anyone who has abdominal pain, that it ranges from young women with dysmenorrhea to people with irritable bowel, to people with acid reflux, their abdomen shows very little movement during breathing. Spinal movement. Technically, as you inhale and exhale, the spine ought to be moving. Look at a very little kid. So we, each disc gets some almost a massage. And then breathing is non-verbal non communications. I give a sigh of relief. I know all of you have waited with bated breath. Anyway, it modulates emotions. And it really links the involuntary. So it's a critical issue. To breathe more effortlessly, you breathe like this. Not like this. Very simple. When you inhale, the diaphragm tightens. This whole area widens. Just like this. And when you exhale, the inverse occurs and the air goes out. It's a simple dynamic process which you want to do. How can you use biofeedback for it? I won't be able to do this all today, but for workshops or so, you can record. You can record from the shoulders. Very cheap, with a home device, an EMG, put it on the scaling, the scaling, entropesius, and then you can see when you inhale, you can just see the muscles. Oh, that's the wrong way. I want almost no activity there. It's a cheap way to teach people how to breathe lower. I can use strain gauges. I can, or I can also use the EMG from the lower abdomen, very low near the pubis, to see when the person inhales, when they're sitting, the area can relax a bit. For, the, for many people with abdominal surgery, uh, uh, hysterectomies, uh, cesareans, uh, for men, um, hernias, they have learned to hold that area almost tight and not relax it. So during inhalation, they want to be able to let it go. Then all of you are familiar, I presume, or some, you can use strain gauges around the abdomen and chest to look at the pattern. And the pattern really ought to be when a person is relaxed, it inhales, 
the transition exhales drifts off to nothing and comes back again obviously what breathing needs to be is dynamic there's no fixed absolute number it is dynamic that it should change depending on the task you can measure the temperature from the nostril as you exhale the temperature goes up as you inhale the temperature goes down depending on the room temperature it's a nice cheap way to look at home or with a portable device very useful is the end tidal co2 for people to see if they are over breathing which is probably a covert illness for many people who have any anxieties they tend to have lower pco2 that means as you exhale it measures how much carbon dioxide is at the end of the exhalation and and for people who have cooler hands sweaty hands anxiety often they're breathing too quickly and their pco2 is too low you need it if you increase the carbon dioxide by slower exhalation and less airflow in the sense the carbon dioxide goes up and their periphery will warm more easily and then we have the whole work of heart rate variability which you can measure at home very usefully with variable devices and as a therapist you can look at that using especially the the, the pulse amplitude ones on the finger like in the us you have i choose so there are many other ones you can use that are very helpful okay i want to focus on one thing which is critical when you go to a healthcare professional, at least I've never had my doctor ask that, how do you breathe most of the day? Do you breathe through your nose or do you breathe through your mouth? When we teach people how to breathe, do we teach them to breathe through their mouth or through their nose? Often we teach people to breathe through their mouth on exhalation. Because when you breathe through your mouth and make it a fricative where you have to apply pressure your pelvic floor will tighten at the same time just do this for a moment take a breath in and as you exhale make a very small opening and also sound and you feel your anus tightening and your pelvic floor tightening and your abdominal wall coming up is that correct just do it for a moment this means yes this means no. Great, you got it? This has this it goes right back to biological to develop mental processes. When we are a little as we are in embryo developing, the the same set of cells that form our face, the bilateralness here, also connects to our reproductive system and our pelvic floor. So when we tighten our pelvic floor, we often will tend to tighten our lips and mouth. If you relax the lips and mouth, you can relax the pelvic floor more. For women, if they're doing Kegel exercises, which is often done using EMG to help people with incontinence, if they do it during the exhalation phase this way, pss, they'll automatically tighten the pelvic floor. And if they now inhale and relax the jaw, then the pelvic floor will relax. However, you need to let the inhalation flow through your nose. I recommend inhaling and exhaling only through the nose. And if you practice this a lot, it may even reduce snoring for people over time. It takes, it's very challenging to do. But why, why would I want to recommend breathing through the nose? And especially in the viral world and polluted world? Well, it's obviously. It filters the air. It moisturizes the air when it's dry. It slows the flow of air both ways in and out. That means air can stay longer in the alveoli. So the oxygen can be transported across the alveolar membrane and taken up by the red cells, by the hemoglobin. Because if I breathe very quickly, the oxygen, I mainly exhale the oxygen again. There's not enough time for transport. 
oxygen takes much longer to go across the alveoli membrane than carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream. It reduces the air turbulence, so there's much less irritation in the airways. And most important to, if I think of COVID-19, our nasal cavities produce lots of nitric oxide that works out. <coughs> Low concentrations promote the growth and activity of immune function, and the higher concentrations produced by the body act as antimicrobial, antiviral. So when I'm breathing through my nose, I give myself my own medication in the sense of antiviral activity. And it increases vasodilation by relaxing the smooth muscles of the blood flow. So when you're inhaling and exhaling through the nose, especially when you're going slower, letting the PCO2 slightly build up, the blood vessels dilate more and really promote a sense of relaxation and warmth. And I would really recommend for athletes and many people when you walk down the streets, to only breathe through your nose, even when you walk up the stairs in the building, practice work breathing through your nose. It, it's a very nice modulator. And if you find that your nose is clogged, well, just check it out for a moment. Close one nose. Inhale. Now the other. How many found that the right nostril is more open? How many found the left nostril is more open? How many found both are the same or both closed? Okay. Well, as a speaker, I'm in difficulty. If your right nostril is more open, it means your left hemisphere is slightly more active. And all the left hemisphere cognitive tasks are slightly more activated. If my right, my left nostril is open, my right hemisphere is slightly more activated. And this alternates from 60 to usually about 90 minutes. You can check this during the day. It will alternate about every 90 minutes, but it varies per person. And if you found that your nose is clogged, Then all you do is you move your arms back and forth. Just move your arms like this. All of you stand up. Once again. Really move. Really massage underneath your armpits. Really, let the, really get a good massage in your armpits. You can also massage your armpits like this. <laughs> but really And breathe through your nose as you're doing it. Keep breathing through your nose. Good enough. You can all sit. And as you did this, you probably wouldn't notice much change in your nose right now. But any of you have done sports or jogging know that when people start running, in the first mile, all of a sudden their nose starts draining and snot comes out. Is that familiar? as if the airways open up. The reason is there's a reflex from the armpit to the, to the, to the nose and opens it up. It will reduce the edema. When you massage in here, when pressure is applied here, it opens up the opposite nostril. It's a baby reflex when the baby was initially breastfeeding. And it still works for us. So when I think of people who have allergies, in that sense, maybe they're not moving their arms enough. I am not saying that's the only thing, obviously. Okay, enough. I'm going to skip these exercises. Uh, let me just practice for a moment a little practice of nose breathing we can do with our clients, okay? Or ourselves. You've just moved. What I want you to do for a moment is I would like you to breathe lower in your, that means that your body is like a pear, that when the air inhales, 
your waist widens, your, your, your stomach gets slightly bigger. When you exhale, it sort of comes in. You don't have to do any work, okay? But be sure if you have a belt, that your belt is loose enough that you can do it. And it helps, and it's very difficult to sit at the screen because if I look at some of you, some of you are sitting like this. When you're collapsed like that, it's almost impossible to do easy diaphragmatic breathing. You have to almost sit up more with a slight arch in your lower back. So, so, what, so what I do often is that sitting at home with a pillow, I put a pillow in my mid back. I'm sorry, you can't see it, but with a pillow sort of here, so I'm slightly more up when I sit on the couch. Because when I'm sitting collapsed like this, I evoke the physiology of depression. My cognitions, in many studies we have published, we can show that. You cannot do good abstract thinking. You do worse in mathematics, in ma mental math, and it's easier to access hopeless, helpless, powerless thoughts. If I am more up, it's easier to access positive thoughts. I won't focus on that today, but keep that in mind. And if you're intrigued for some of this, go to my, my blog where and or the articles we have published on Pepper Perspective. You can see them with the instructions. So sit so you're slightly more tall. You know, your chin. Let your hands drop on your lap. Feel your abdomen. And for a moment, notice that when you inhale, the stomach gets slightly wider. It almost go, comes in by itself. And when you exhale, the area around your stomach gets smaller. Can you feel that when you're doing this? This means yes. Great, thank you. Now what I'd like you to do is with your right hand, I want you to put it on your left shoulder. Now take a breath in your abdomen. And as you exhale, squeeze your arm and stroke the arm down as you exhale. Really feel the pressure during the exhalation. So I'm going to make a sound through my mouth. I don't want you to make the sound. You, I want you to keep breathing through your nose. But just for a moment, if I make the sound too, so it's like I inhale, then I exhale, and I'm stroking all the way down my arm. Do that another time. As if you're pulling the air right down your arms. And now to the other side. One more time. Really stroke your arm all the way down to your hands. And now you put both hands on your hip. Take another breath. And then as you exhale, you stroke from your hips, down your thighs, down your calves. Psst, really squeeze through your feet. And do it one more time. Psst. Good. And now for a moment, just sit quietly. Drop your hands back on your lap. Let your eyes be closed if that feels comfortable. And now as you inhale through your nose, let the air flow in. Feel the spot where the cool air enters your nose. Feel the stomach slightly widening. And then as you exhale, let the air flow out of your nose. Feel that spot where the warm air exits your nose. Let that spot go further, let the air flow slower. And then repeat that, let the air flow in. And then eventually let the air flow out again. And now let the air flow in again, be aware where the cool spot occurs. And this time as the air flows out, imagine the flow can go right down your arms and out your fingers. You can almost still feel the place where you previously had touched it and stroked it. 
So each time you exhale, let the air flow through your nose, feel it like a streaming going through your arms and out your fingers. And even do it for your, and the next breath you inhale through your nose and as you exhale through your nose, think of the air flowing down your thighs, down your knees, calves and out your feet. And if you keep doing this, and for today, we could, I could guide you for about 10 minutes or so doing this, I will not. Each time your attention wanders, bring it right back. Okay, I'll let you all stretch for a moment. Ah, and we go. Okay. I want to end for today, in the next few minutes, talking about tech stress. I realize I could have spent two hours doing the breathing. But this little exercise that I just did earlier is often helpful because by touching, I capture the person's attention. They feel it more easily. They can stop worrying, thinking. And so they feel they're more somatically connected. <clears throat> okay, let me go to the next part. Technology stress as we spend many more hours in front of the computer, at least I do, with Zoom. I now use my computer for work, for teaching, and social connection. I personally like it. It's been much more fun to see you in person, I can promise you. I like it, I would like it much better. But anyway, how many of you experience discomfort working at the computer at the end? Or how many have how many get neck and shoulder tension? How many have dry eyes, get exhausted? I think all of us do. Exhaustion, stiffness, neck pain, you name it. I'm gonna skip all those. We have something called Zoom fatigue. And by the end of the day, you're just tired, low energy. And then our children are, and we are addicted to keep checking my cell phone. What is my social media, okay? And we work like this, or we work like this, since we couldn't go to the office, or as young children, we all socially meet like this. And if you have gray hair, you meet like this in person, but now they're texting to each other. Uh, or here we work, or here we do our vacation along the beach, or even at school, we don't have time or we sit in awkward positions, or we socialize with our friends. And even at night, we sleep next to each other and we look at our imaginary cell phone still wondering what the messages of our ex-lovers. No. <laughs> and we have social isolation. In many ways, people are prisoners of their phones. That's why they're called cell phones in English. It's a joke on language which I know, but we are using it all the time in self-connecting. Let's see. Let me check with Luca. Luca, could I have five minutes later after for the hour? You think that's okay for most of you? Yes, I think no problem. Oh, no, I, you know, I realized that I, then I will, the question is why do people get this comfort? So I like you to do a little exercise. As you're sitting in front of your computer, uh, you can either take your mouse, hold your mouse next to the keyboard to the side, or your joystick. And if you're using a trackpad, put, it, put the trackpad next to your keyboard. You can even put it a little bit further away to the side like you often do. And what I'd like you to do now, in a moment, not yet, is I'd like you to take your street address, like my office address is Derby Street, and what I'd like you to do with the mouse is draw each letter, but backwards. We're starting with the last letter. So Derby Street, the last letter would be T. I would draw the letter T with the mouse. I move the hand. Then I, I do a left click, click. Then I draw the, the previous letter, the E. I click again. 
Is the instruction clear? Yes? Then I like, when before doing that, when you're doing this, I want each letter to be no bigger than one centimeter. Ideally, a half centimeter, five millimeters would be perfect. Okay? And do it as quickly. Are you ready? Yes? Okay, go. Do it as quickly as possible, right now. Draw it quickly. The last letter, click. Next letter, quick. Quicker, quicker, don't make a mistake. Quicker. Quicker. Very small movements, very fine. I think that's enough. What did you notice when you did this? What did you experience? How many held your breath? How many noticed your shoulders tightening? How many found even your whole body tightened slightly? You stabilized. How many went more forward to do it correctly? We did all those changes and many more without awareness. And this is what happens when we work at the computer. This is consistent of hundreds, about least hundreds of people we have worked with. They vary. Each one is different, but these are thematic. When we, we sit there, our hands on our lap, we are restful. He is breathing. He has the heart rate. He has the pulse. He has the sweatiness, the skin conductance. He has the muscle tension of the deltoids, the shoulders, the muscle, sorry, the muscle tension of the forearm. And the person sits like this, the hands on their lap, they're relaxed. Now they bring their hands to the keyboard. They're now getting ready to work. They're not typing, they're just resting there. This is true, not for everybody, obviously. For many people, they already start anticipating their work. They breathe more quickly. Their heart rate may slightly go up. Their muscle tension of the shoulders go up, which they probably needed to go up when they lifted their arms up to drop them at the keyboard. It didn't go down. I mean, this is their form, but they never relaxed. And when you ask them what happened, they say nothing. I did, I feel perfectly relaxed resting at the keyboard. Now they work. They have more neck, they have more forearm tension. That's correct because they're moving their fingers. Their shoulders stay tense. They keep breathing more quickly. The heart rate stays up because they're working. And then you see the same pattern at the end. If you ask the person, for most of you, what did you experience? Most would just say, I've noticed this. I noticed that my forearm fingers were done. They're unaware that their neck and shoulders were tight till much later, by the end of the day. They have no idea their breathing pattern may have changed. For this, biofeedback is probably the most superb way to show it and interrupt it. He has a similar pattern of somebody else. In this case, when the person just rested their hands at the keyboard, their shoulders also went up. Or when you work with little kids, we have published this many years ago, and with kids who play computer games, they will do this for 20 minutes like this, or 30 minutes. As long as they were playing, they were breathing like this. <laughs> they have no idea they were doing this. And for some, and for many people, this pattern may continue, or in others, it can turn down. I already said what it was. And what you, the other part you see here, and the other, notice the muscle tension. Here's muscle tension, and then there are no breaks. There are no EMG gaps. There's no moment for muscles to relax, if you can see it. You can also see that in the previous slide. Here's the baseline level. Here, notice this whole time, there's no, re no rest. If you, muscles are not designed, evolved to tighten only. EMG is a superb way of showing this. So let me experience this. As you're sitting, I like to do a little exercise. I like you just to lift your knee slightly up so your foot 
is two inch, two centimeters from the floor. That's all. You're doing that? The few, yeah, great. And how long can you hold this up? Five minutes, 10 minutes? It depends how much I pay you. That's called motivation. Right, Matilda? I'll let it go. For many of you, even this short time period, you start to get some achiness in the hip flexors, correct? You would got tired. And yet many of you, you know, you can go hiking for the Dolomites or anywhere for Rome or anywhere you are. You can hike for hours and you have no problem. How come? Because the same muscle I asked you to lift, you would lift to bring the foot forward, then it would relax, regenerate, and it goes back and forth. That's what's happening in the muscles in the neck and shoulders and back when we work at the computer or around our eyes. We need to alternate moments of, of breaks. If I think in summary, how can you use biofeedback to reduce tech stress? And I think it's superb to do this. It's the best demonstration I know. It makes the unfelt visible. It makes the invisible visible. It makes the undocumented documentable. Muscle tension from the trapezius and forearm. Measure the respiration pattern. You train people to reduce dyspinesis. That means inappropriate tensions. You train for small breaks. And you can do ergonomic assessments like the following. Oh, before going on, this book, I'm sure you... Uh, Luca can gift, can send this to you and he will probably distribute it as well. You can get the free copy of an old book we wrote, a manual, how to use EMG at the computer. We made it available at no charge. You can download it from BFE, helping clients who are working at home. I'm sure Luca will, can, can send the email much easier. Does that make sense? Is that okay, Luca? Would that be a good idea? Okay, yes, that's one. we will. And then you can have ergonomics. You can see when you monitor from the neck. You have much more neck and shoulder tension. When you sit correctly, it's lower. I won't have time to go for all this. Or if you work at a white keyboard, mousing, you have more tension. When you work, when you work, more, work centrally, you have less tension. There are, you know, there are so many factors I am not going to cover. But the most important one for yourself to take home take many breaks at the computer. We did a few, and I think every time we did a little exercise, you felt a little better. You can download this app, install it at your computer. It is, this allows an, a small program to pop up. Maybe I can show it to you. I won't promise it will work. It's an old app, but it works phenomenally. I love it. It's very simple. Can you see this coming up? You see something or not? No? Okay, sorry. Uh, but it, it's a dynamic, it guides people through exercises or whatever. And you can set the timing of it so every 20 minutes it pops up on my screen. Or every 30 minutes, it reminds me to take breaks. It's free, it used to cost money, but now you can get it free. I did that already, I'm gonna skip these. And finally, in summary, if you want to learn about these concepts, we just have a new book coming out. This is the final advertisement for it. And that is, uh, it's called Tech Stress, How Technology is Hijacking Our Lives, Strategies for Coping and Pragmatic Ergonomics. It is really pragmatic with lots of illustrations and techniques for cognitive, emotional, and it takes an evolutionary perspective. So it's about why we react as we do. I would highly recommend it, uh, obviously. <laughs> I think it's great. Uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna skip all these because I don't have time. I think finally, in summary, if I pull it back, looking at the clock, wherever you are, 
take many breaks. Every minute, stand up and regenerate. Remember, breathe through your nose. Stop watching negative news. Watch positive humor movies. Meet with your friends. Support them. Go outside, have fresh air, and have great healthy meals of vegetables and fruits. Skip McDonald's and Coca-Cola. Reconnect with friends and remind ourselves that this too will pass and the future is remarkable. Thank you all. I should say questions. Are there questions? I know I talked a lot. It must be very difficult to follow. I'm sure Luca may, that you rec did recordings and I'm sure he can make this available, this link available for people, I suspect. Yes, we will make it available for people. We thank you very much for your presentation. My pleasure. The time you dedicated us. And I, I hope to see soon in Italy. And so you I hope so too. It's much to more fun. Many of the I would love to see all of you. <laughs> that you have seen together today. Great. Maybe that they will meet you uh, directly. Okay. I have one question for everybody. And that is, if you all, I've talked about some things. Could you think for a moment and say, what was the one piece that was useful for you? that you could take home for yourself and your clients. Does that make sense? You can have two things, one for yourself and one for your clients. So think about that for a moment. Give yourself about 30 seconds or so to think about that. And when you got that, Start writing it in the chat box in Italian. It's okay. Luca is going to do all the work. <laughs> and type it in the chat box. But do not yet hit return. Just, chat, just type it into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. So what was useful for you that you will really take home for yourself and possibly for your clients? And now just hit return so we can all see your responses. Great. You keep adding more to them. So it's like avoiding, avoiding business, business recycled air, stretch breaks, hopefully that will be useful. How am I breathing? Great. Well, I thank you all very much for participating. And I look forward to seeing you in actuality. And please, if you can send to Luca sometime an email of topics or how it can be done better, we would appreciate that or feedback of assessment. Okay. Okay. Look at, thanks so much. Thank you. Such Thank a pleasure you, seeing Eric. all of you. Bye-bye. Thanks to everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.